our discussion on biophysical methods. In the last class, we learned about UV spectroscopy, IR, and a bit about circular dichroism. What we will do in this class is we will look at protein fluorescence, protein resonance energy, or fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and mass spectrometry. A bit about mass spectrometry. The specific idea that we are going to look at here is what the fluorophores are, what we mean by a quenching, and what we mean by fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and how that can help us in estimating our protein in its folded content, in its unfolded condition, and also protein ligand binding, which we will look at later on when we consider the specific topics. When we look at protein, protein fluorescence, as we have seen before, we look at these three aromatic amino acid residues that are responsible for protein fluorescence. In a knowledge of the proximity of the aromatic groups in a folded protein, there is efficient energy transfer between these groups. In protein fluorescence, when we have the three aromatic residues and we have tryptophan, the fluorescence emission is typically controlled by tryptophan and the emission that we see is due to this. With a combination of the aromatic amino acids, we either see that typical of tyrosine depending upon the presence of the aromatic residues in the protein sequence. So the biological fluorophores that we look at in the intrinsic fluorophores, we understand now that tryptophan dominates protein fluorescent spectra. This is because it has a high molar absorptivity, even though it has moderate quantum yield, and it has the ability to quench tyrosine and phenylalanine emission by energy transfer. The emission spectrum of tryptophan with a, a small content of tyrosine can be seen here at the specific excitation wavelengths. The excitation wavelength of 275 nanometers, if we go back and have a look at this slide, we will see when we have the excitation at 275 nanometers, there is a possibility that we are exciting both tyrosine and tryptophan. So the emission intensity that we observe is going to be a mixture of tryptophan and tyrosine. So the common method is to excite the protein at 295 nanometers so that we do not see any interference from the tyrosine residue. As the tryptophan residue now becomes hydrogen bonding, say due to a particular denaturer that results in the unfolding of the protein, there is an exposure of this tryptophan to the solvent. Now, this exposure results in what is called a red shift, as is evident from the spectra that we see here, where we have the fluorescence emission intensity on the y-axis and the wavelength on the x-axis. So, as the tryptophan becomes hydrogen bonded or is exposed to water, the emission shifts to longer wavelength that gives us an indication not only of the exposure of the tryptophan, but if we have ligand binding, we can also observe quenching of the tryptophan fluorescence. So the tryptophan fluoresceduces that are exposed to water fluoresce maximally at a wavelength of 350 nanometers, while those that are totally buried emit about 330 nanometers. So given this range, we can understand where our tryptophan residue lies. For example, if we look at the new tryptophan in the nuclease protein here, we see that this is where it exists in the folded protein, where it is situated in the folded protein. If we do a particular experiment where we unfold the protein, what we can observe is we can see that the tryptophan emission intensity has red shifted for the unfolded protein, which is this spectrum here. So this can also lead us to an identification of locations of important tryptophan residues. A knowledge of the tryptophan repressor tells us that there are two tryptophans per monomeric unit. One of these tryptophans, as we can see marked in blue here, is located, buried in this structure, and this is located relatively on the surface. So what can be done is a look at the tryptophan exposure to water can also be monitored if we do a mutation study. 
whereby a single mutation would change the tryptophan residue present, say, in position 19, and tell us which tryptophan is actually in the more stable part of the protein in comparison to one another, which we see from this particular diagram or this particular protein, we see that the tryptophan at position 19 is in a more stable part of the protein than that at 99. So this fluorescence by a protein is, in, is complex when there are more than one aromatic side chains because we have the contributions from the others as well. And also, as we saw, when we have multiple tryptophan residues also. So the proximity of the aromatic groups in a folded protein results in efficient energy transfer between these groups. And the light absorbed by one chromophore can also be transferred to another that absorbs at a longer wavelength because we know that the fluorescence emission spectra is red shifted from the absorption. And what can happen, that can also emit the energy as fluorescence. This is what accounts for fluorescence resonance energy transfer. In this resonance energy transfer, it gives us a method to measure the distances between sites on macromolecules. The important part about this is the use of FRET is used due to favorable distance for energy transfer, which are typical of the size of the protein and also of the thickness of the membrane. So if we look at the methodolog methodology of FRET, what we see is the spectral overlap of the donor emission spectra and the acceptor absorption spectra, which is evident from this diagram that we see here. So when we have the donor emission, so the donor excitation is or the donor absorption is somewhere more blue shifted to a lower wavelength here. And this is the donor emission. Now, this emission can result in the excitation of an acceptor within a certain distance from it. So if it is in close proximity, this donor emission can be able to excite the acceptor absorbance where there is an overlap of the donor emission spectra and the acceptor absorption spectra. And what we see is this is called the overlap integral. The acceptor in turn can also fluoresce, which would be further ref shifted in this direction. But so we have the fluorescence resonance energy transfer that is a measure of the distance or can give us a measure of the distance from the donor to the acceptor. Now this fret occurs between a donor molecule in the excited state and an acceptor molecule in the ground state. And as we saw, the donor molecules emit at wavelengths that overlap with the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. So we can actually then mark our proteins or tag our proteins with an acceptor and a donor and then monitor the folding or we can monitor the distance at which they gradually approach each other while the protein is folding with, because it has to be within a particular distance r for the resonance energy transfer to occur. So this energy transfer occurs without the appearance of a photon and is a result of the long-range dipole-dipole interactions between the donor and the acceptor. The rate of energy transfer is given by kT and the expression is kTr, which is the distance, 1 by tau d, where tau d is the decay time of the donor in the absence of the acceptor. R0 is the Forster distance, which you will see what it means in a moment. And R is the donor to acceptor distance. If we look at a specific diagram of the energy versus the R by R0 ratio, when we have this R equal to R0 with 50% energy transfer efficiency, then we call this R0 as the Forster distance, which is typically in the range of 20 to 60 angstroms. And this dependence of the energy transfer on the distance is important in understanding how we can measure the proximity of the donor and the acceptor molecule. This rate of energy transfer would therefore depend upon the extent of the spectral overlap of the emission spectrum of the donor with the absorption spectrum of the acceptor, the quantum yield of the donor, the relative orientation of the donor and acceptor transition dipoles, and the distance between the donor and the acceptor molecules. Foster distances ranging from 20 to 90 angstroms are convenient for studies of 
biological macromolecules. And these distances are actually comparable to the size of the biomacromolecules and the distances between multi subunits proteins. And what we can do is this DA distance will be affected by the transfer rate. And what it can do is it can allow the change in the distance to be quantified. And because of this, it is sometimes referred to as a spectroscopic ruler. So what we did look at is the possibility of locating specific residues that can be tagged with fluorophores as a donor and an acceptor. And based on this distance, we can look at protein folding, unfolding techniques, or even protein ligand transfers, protein ligand interactions, which we will see later as we go along in the course. The structural information about the macromolecule, therefore, that can be obtained. For instance, if we look at the energy transfer, we can measure the distance from a tryptophan residue to a ligand binding, where we can look at not only at the fluorescence emission quenching, but also to a resonance energy transfer. And in the case of multi-domain proteins, this resonance energy transfer can be used to measure conformational changes that move the domains closer or further apart, depending upon the donor acceptor distance. In our next understanding of what we can do with our protein molecules that we have isolated, there is a methodology that we can look at measure the mass of the molecule. Mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that measures the mass to charge ratio of ions. It is a quantitative analysis and what it does, it can de determine the mass of the molecules such as peptides and other chemical compounds. It typically has an ion source, an electromagnetic system here and then a detector where we can actually look at and monitor the specific mass to charge ratio. The spectrometer contains of an ionization source where we have the ionization of the molecules that produce gas phase ions that can be moved by the external and electrical and magnetic fields depending upon the mass to charge ratio. This mass to charge ratio will then sort and separate the ions where we can have a mass analyzer. And finally, there is an ion detection system where the separated ions are then detected by a specific detector. There are different types of ionization techniques. The, all the methodologies use an ion source, a mass analyzer followed by a detector. When we are looking at liquid chromatography, we have a spray needle, a nozzle, and we have electrospray ionization. And because of the presence of the electromagnetic field here, the ions move to the detector based on their mass by charge ratio. There is also a reflector time of flight, a TOF as it is called, a TOF, or a time of flight, time of flight that just increases the distance here and the detector is located in a position where the mass by charge ratio of the different fragments can be collected and analyzed. A common methodology for the mass of proteins is matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, MALD, MALD TOF, which we will see in a bit detail in the next slide. In matrix assistant laser desorption ionization, the protein molecule is mixed with a matrix. This is a soft ionization technique. It strikes the large molecule with a laser into ion fragments and produces few multi-charged ions. It is applicable in the analysis of the biomolecules. And this is the typical methodology. So we have a target plate which has the analyte spots and the matrix where we have the protein mixed with this specific matrix. The laser beam is shown on this target plate and there is desorption due to the laser beam that is sh shown on the plate. Then there is desolvation and ionization, proton transfer leading to a mass by charge ratio that then moves on in the TOF technique in the time of flight 
to the mass analyzer in the detector. So in the Maldi time of flight, the m by z ratio of an ion is calculated by analyzing the time needed for it to travel the length of the flight tube. This is a typical example of how this takes place. So here we have our an analysis in this inset here, where we have the sample the, on this plate mixed with the matrix. We have the laser on the matrix plate. Then with the production of the laser, it ionizes and gradually moves to the detector. And depending upon the m by z ratio, it would reach the detector and we would get a peak depending upon which molecule has reached earlier, which would depend upon the mass by charge ratio in the time of flight. So the finally, we would get these two peaks depending upon the mass by charge ratio, giving us an indication of the mass of the molecules that we had present in our mixture of proteins. If we now look at a different methodology where we can also understand the chemical structure of many macromolecules in nuclear magnetic resonance. In our overview of the protein structure prediction, we had briefly looked at NMR in the understanding of a protein structure and how it may be predicted. When we look at NMR in this context, we are looking at a characterization of the protein to know whether the protein is in its folded form, to know whether the protein will be able to perform its function. And later on, we will also look at the variations in the spectrum due to ligand interactions with the protein. So in the methodology of NMR, we know that there is a magnetic field that is produced by the circulating electron, which is then observed or many techniques or further analysis done to figure out or look at the specific chemical shift assignments that will give us restraints or additional NMR restraints that can be added in terms of distance, angle, hydrogen bond, the specific orientations. And this will lead to specific chemical shift assignments followed by calibration, giving us a specific distance, distance geometry that would give us some basic structure of the protein that we are interested in. When we look at the protein chemical shifts, we can see the proton chemical shift position of a chemical group, say, in ubiquity. Now, if we look at the specific types of protons that are present in proteins, these are the different types of protons that we see. Knowing that the amino acids linked together have their hydrogen atoms in the backbone, in aromatic amino acids, in the specific side chains, also in our alpha hydrogen atoms that we see, and the aliphatic and the methyl groups. So depending upon this, there is going to be a specific chemical shift associated with the proton that is dependent on the chemical group, particularly present in the proteins. So for example, if we look at NMR chemical shifts in a folded structure, we are looking at, say, the tyrosine or the threonine or different types of residues that have hydrogen in them. If we are looking at a proton NMR, we are interested in the chemical shifts in the globular protein. So when we look at the folded protein, we realize that the local magnetic environment is going to be different because of its folded structure as can be observed here. What is different here is the aromatic ring currents are different, the hydrogen bonding is different, the overall electrostatics is different, which results in a different local environment, a different magnetic environment giving us a completely different structure overall, a different NMR spectrum for the folded protein. 
However, when the protein is unfolded, what happens in this case is we are looking at a random coil where we are going to have a solvated environment, but the overall local environment is going to change, resulting in chemical shifts that are indicative of the difference of the folded protein from the unfolded polypeptide. This indication is important in an understanding where we can look at specific chemical shifts to see whether we have our ligands bound to the specific, say, amino acids in the active site of enzymes. If we are interested to develop inhibitors to understand whether we have the specific chemical shifts or variations because of the, these specific interactions. So what we looked at in this lecture is an understanding of protein fluorescence, telling us that we have the aromatic amino acid residues that contribute to our overall structure, our overall protein fluorescence with tryptophan dominating the fluorescence. Then this tryptophan can have its emission intensity shifted to the right, red shifted to a higher wavelength that is indicative of its exposure to solvent, or we could have fluorescence quenching that is indicative for protein ligand binding, which we will see in subsequent lectures. Another concept that we looked at is fluorescence resonance energy transfer, where the donor emission, a fluorescence donor emission, can excite an acceptor molecule if there is an overlap between the donor emission and the acceptor absorption. This can lead to us identifying donor absorption or donor acceptor distances that are important in understanding the folding of proteins or even multi-subunit proteins to see the proximity of specific donors and acceptors that may also be tagged along into the proteins. Another aspect is looking at protein ligand binding where we could have donor to acceptor energy transfer. We look at a brief introduction or a brief, brief discussion on mass spectrometry and how it may be used to determine the molecular weight from a mass by charge ratio using MALDI-TOF, most commonly used for proteins. Another aspect of protein structure prediction, but also protein ligand binding, is a looking at the chemical shifts of protons or specific atoms where we will be able to identify protein folding and unfolding in addition to protein ligand interactions. These are the references, Biophysical Chemistry by Cantor and Schimmel, Lakowitz for protein fluorescence spectroscopy and principles of physical biochemistry in addition to the book by Gavina for protein NMR spectroscopy. Thank you.